Good morning to you. In all the welter of political news this week, finally a significant shift by Labour. Jeremy Corbyn's new offer to the Prime Minister on Brexit is centred around Britain staying in a customs union. It might get through the House of Commons, they seem to love it in Brussels, for now at least, but it would, of course, split the Tory party wide open, which is, I am sure, completely accidental. Is there the faintest glimmer that Theresa May might agree to Mr Corbyn's offer? One of her closest allies, the Housing Secretary, James Brokenshire, will, I'm sure, fill us in. And would the EU really accept such a proposal? Austria's Foreign Minister, Karin Kneissel, joins us from Vienna. But Mr Corbyn's change of policy has angered Labour MPs who want another referendum, adding to a fractious week dominated yet again by talk of splits. Labour's Deputy Leader, Tom Watson, joins us from Birmingham. And it's the BAFTAs tonight, and Spike Lee's Black Klansman is up for five awards. He's been telling me about that, Liam Neeson's comments, plus he gave this advice to US Democrats seeking to challenge Donald Trump in 2020. This guy, you gotta get dirty, down and dirty, take the, the gloves off with this guy. Reviewing the news, Pippa Creera from The Mirror and Jane Moore from The Sun. Now the headlines with Louise Minchin. Very good morning. Theresa May will attempt to head off further opposition to her Brexit strategy this week by urging MPs to give her more time to achieve changes to the plan to avoid a hard Irish border. The Prime Minister is expected to promise that Parliament will be given another say on Brexit if she's unable to recommend a revised deal by the end of the month. Company executives who mismanaged their employees' pension scheme could be jailed for up to seven years under a new law planned by the government. Ministers decided to review the legislation after the collapse of BHS in 2016 with a large pensions deficit. The new law will target willful or reckless behaviour by executives, according to the Work and Pension Secretary Amber Rudd. Buckingham Palace says the Duke of Edinburgh has voluntarily surrendered his driving licence. Prince Philip, who is 97, was recently involved in a crash with a car carrying two women and a baby. The Crown Prosecution Service said it would take the development into account when deciding if any further action should be taken. Two people arrested in connection with a house fire in Stafford, which killed four children, have been released on bail. The 24-year-old woman and 28-year-old man were arrested on suspicion of manslaughter by gross negligence. The children, aged between three and eight, died in a fire on Tuesday. Some of the biggest names in cinema are set to gather at London's Royal Albert Hall tonight for this year's BAFTA Film Awards. The favourite, starring Olivia Colman, leads the race with 12 nominations. The period drama is set in the court of the 18th century monarch, Queen Anne. That is all from me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. It's back to you, Andrew. And so... As you would expect, the papers. Thanks, Louise, for that. There's the Sunday Express. They have got a kind of political story. The Speaker, John Burko and Ken Clark spotted in a curry restaurant. No-one knows exactly what they said, but it allows a Tory MP to talk about the Poppadom plotters, which is very good news for all of us. Uh, the Observer has a story suggesting that MPs want Chris Grayling, the Transport Secretary, to be sacked after he gave that contract uh, for a ferry to a ferry company with no ferries. That's now been cancelled in turn. The Mail on Sunday, we'll talk about this, has an absolutely uh, coruscating, savage attack on Jeremy Corbyn for page after page after page after page based on a book. Um, the Sunday Mirror has a story about, uh, as they all do, of course, um, the Duke of Edinburgh giving up his driving licence. The Sunday Telegraph, which has been leading on the Philip Green story, uh, facing big political, uh, legal problems over that, has pages about that. And then finally, the Sunday Times has a story, splashing a story about child victims on dating apps and looking forward, as many people are, to the BAFTAs tonight. But let's start with the politics. And we're going to start with, I think, this extraordinary series of attacks on the, the Labour leader um, in the Mail on Sunday. It is a kind of massive hit job, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, th there's a phrase which I learned about this week that the kids say on hashtag on social media, sips tea, which means to gossip. 
Oh, right. Uh, and I must say, I rather sipped my tea when I looked at the Mail on Sunday front page right. this morning. Um, because, look, we have married to a joyless fanatic, two of Jeremy Corbyn's ex-wives. Now As they say that's a bad thing. Well, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and they say no man is a hero to his valet. Well, he's certainly not a hero to any of his ex-wives either. Um, and as you say, unfit for office, it is, it is a complete hatchet job. If you're in the Westminster bubble, there's nothing in here that you probably don't already know. It's just obviously all now being collated under one roof um, with... with uh, I, I don't think um, this lady has given a face-to-face. -face. This is all kind of like third-party stuff with, with the ex-wives. Uh, How the many ex -wives. pages have they done? Uh, it's, it amounts to around 20 20 in total. pages of attack. Um, and I think the most stunning revelation is that uh, he usually ate Tesco beans, not Heinz. Other supermarket brands are available. Uh, and he wouldn't know the difference. Wouldn't know the difference. It's cold as well. <laughs> <laughs> what about the timing of this, yeah. Pippa? Mm. It is interesting, isn't it? I mean, for the Mail on Sunday to devote 20 pages to Jeremy Corbyn suggests that um, they... Are possibly taking him more seriously than they have as a threat to the Tory government um, for some time. And uh, there's a suggestion, there's been lots of rumours around Westminster this week about Labour MPs finally splitting away, a small group, maybe half a dozen Labour MPs finally splitting away from the Labour Party. A couple even said that they were thinking about quitting um, as a result of Corbyn's Brexit policy. Uh, week, and, yeah. and so Labour splits, which we've talked about for a long, long time, there was a, sort of almost an assumption that that would happen fairly imminently. Right now, so this may have been timed to coincide with exactly. the split that didn't happen, in Exactly, fact. exactly, yes. to undermine his leadership. And it never seems to happen. We, we hear this every so often, you know, all the time, and nobody actually ever... You always hear about Chukka Amuna going to be behind her, mm. but he never seems to play his hand, so... Um, but we've now yeah. got uh, J.K. Rowling. In yeah, the, well, I think, think J.K. Rowling and, and uh, Countdown presenter Rachel Riley are, are really involved in this story because of the pictures that they, that they provide. Um, but, but this is, again, a story saying there are meetings for a new party about yeah. to launch. We don't know the name and it doesn't have a leader. No, and the fourth paragraph <laughs> is, is the proposed party does not yet have a leader. Well, you know, there's been lots of uh, movement amongst sort of Labour centrists, uh, lots of discussion. This particular one is, is apparently being led by... Tony Blair's former chief of staff, Jonathan Powell. Now, it's incredibly difficult to set up a new mm. party. But on one level, it's easy. You just go to the Electoral Commission and get a name and you need some cash for deposits for and your candidates. And there's the worry that candidates. you split vote but, as well. But, then, but in terms of actually having an organisational base and activists and access to data, mm. that's all very, very difficult to do. You'd imagine there's lots of people behind this, J.K. Rowling, they might be able mm. to find the money. Um, but uh, there's been very few parties which have, which have managed to... In fact, the Labour Party is probably the, the most recent one which has set up a new party, in and that was 1900, um, and it took them 45 years to get to power. It's easier to take over an existing party and try and transform yes. it from within. Yes, but yeah. they've been talking about this for longer than Theresa May has been saying Brexit means Brexit. It feels like it's forever, and it never actually happens. No. Uh, the Observer now talking about um, Brexit. There's a cross-party move, apparently, for the Commons to support May May's deal if she agrees to a referendum mm. afterwards on that deal. So um, th this is uh, Labour MP Peter Carl and Phil Wilson. They've won the support of prominent Remainers in the Tory party, including Anna Soubry and Sarah Wollaston, uh, for this. And it would, the amendment would offer all MPs the chance to support or abstain on the withdrawal bill, but would specify that if passed, the decision would be implemented mm. on the condition that it went to the public for a second referendum. And so the idea behind this is MPs who don't like Theresa May compromise might vote for it on the basis that it could then be overturned by the public. Yes, exactly. But, of course, a second referendum has always been one of Theresa May's red flags. Um, yeah. It's, so, who knows? I think, I think it's wishful thinking. I mean, I think what we really have learned in the last couple of weeks at Westminster is that a second referendum does not have a majority in the House of Commons. Mm. And despite the internal wrangling within the Labour Party over whether it can remain as an option on the table if all other options fall away, it's not something which is looking yes. as likely as it did perhaps before Christmas. But what is going to happen in the House of Commons, we think, in this coming week, is another attempt to take back control of the agenda from the government yes. by the end of this month. So if Theresa May mm -hmm. hasn't had a meaningful vote... We, we don't know where we're going by the end of this month. Yes. With just a month to go before Brexit. The Commons grabs control and tries to delay Brexit. Yeah, and the Sunday Times is this story. I mean, I think we were all anticipating this week would finally be the big showdown. It was, you know, newspapers splashing stories on Valentine's Day massacres because we were expecting a big vote on the 14th on, um, on 
uh, if not Theresa May's own deal, then then a, it would be an emotion which could be amendable. So lots of MPs could put down their inversions, and the key we might one, of course, where is we're going. and we might discover where we're going. However, it looks like mm. the the because she's she has gone off to try and renegotiate the backstop yet again. Um, the Conservatives in her own party, who were considering or threatening to resign, the, the Tory Remainers, uh, some of them government ministers, some even in her cabinet, have decided to give her an extra two weeks. And instead, we've got a date. Number 10 has said that if they don't bring her deal back by the 27th, um, then the MPs again will be given a chance to try and take back control. I think the interesting thing that Sunday Times has is that, is that Labour, Keir Starmer, their Bre Shadow Brexit secretary, I don't think it's, it seems to be running out of patience. And what they're trying to do, a suggestion here, is that they will put an amendment down this Thursday, which means that the government has to bring Theresa May's deal back by the We're end of the month. Running out of patience and mm. running out of time. This is a very risky strategy, mm. taking it, it right up to the wire. The Sun has a story yeah. on page two, I think, saying three Theresa Peasy. I never understand Therese that. Theresa Peasy. Headlines yeah, so this, this oh. story is um, actually what a lot of people. Uh, think is going on, which is that the PM is trying to run down the clock to get to the point where fairly mainstream, moderate, Romani type Labour mm. MPs, not just the few yeah. that are concerned about their leave seats, um, faced with the option of no deal, crashing out with no deal or Theresa May's deal, rowing behind I mean, she it. She is an old political hand, isn't yes, she? she is. She is a big gamble, a, though. But Jane, very the, big gamble. The idea behind this is just a week before we actually leave, there's a final EU summit, and then she comes back and gets her deal through right at the last minute. But if that doesn't happen, of course, well, here we go again. We go back to the, the conversation which we've been having forever about is there a possibility that we could just crash out? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to vote mm. on that. We just crash out. And business is getting more and more worried about that all yeah. the time, aren't well, they? Well, it's yeah. the uncertainty, you know. I mean, a lot mm. of people will say, well, whether you voted for Brexit or you voted to remain is almost becoming irrelevant now. It's just the indecision and the chaos and the uncertainty mm. that is causing yeah. the yes. markets to panic. Though there are, of course, an awful lot of people who want to leave on WTO terms. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah so absolutely. They may, they may get their wish. Let's talk about one of the other big stories in the paper, which is Philip Green, who has been being pursued by the press, in particular the Telegraph group, yeah. for a long time over allegations of misbehaviour, which he denies, I say, you know. Again, it's very similar to the Corbyn stuff in that it's kind of everything that we already sort of knew, but just putting a bit more flesh on the bones of it. Mm -hmm. Although the figures are astonishing, aren't they? I mean, the fact that he spent, he uh, paid out £1 million to one particular woman, former employee. I mean, it's a huge amount of money, isn't it? I thought the interesting thing about this actually was there's another story on the front page, which is um, a plan by Amber Rudd um, to make sure that executives who willfully or recklessly mismanage pension funds could face up to seven years in prison. Now, the, the idea of this, according to Amber Rudd's, Rudd's aides, is to avoid another Philip Green star pension scandal, because, of course, Philip Green uh, sold off BHS uh, for a pound in 2015. Uh, went into administration a year later with a with, uh, mm. pension fund deficit of hundreds of millions of pounds and was viewed generally to have treated his pensioners, his former employees, mm. pretty badly. So He's put some money back in since, hasn't he? Put he put 300, so? 363 million pounds he put in, um, some would say under duress, uh, but it was an example, he's been used as an example mm. of uh, an, a, a very sort of powerful tycoon who probably hasn't treated some of his former staff as well as he should have done. And again, it no. puts NDAs under the spotlight. And, you know, a lot of people mm. go, well, why would you take a million pounds? You know, it's all about money. But actually, if you read some of the detail, um, the woman concerned did go with her concerns. Yes. They got, she got shut down. And in the context of being in a big company and getting shut down, you might think that's your only option is to just yeah. take some money and go. And if you're an employee of Philip Green, you don't really want to take him on. And we've talked a lot about the London papers, but there is a, this is a historic day for Britain's regional papers as well. The Manchester it Evening is. News, for the first time <laughs> in 150 years, has published a Sunday edition. What do you think? Yeah, it well, I, I, I'm really um, I'm delighted. I think it's really sort of optimistic that, that and uh, you know, gives us all hope in the newspaper industry that the Manchester Evening News, that stalwart of, um, of journal northern journalism, which is a great institution and breaks some fantastic mm. stories, has decided to become a seven-day-a-week operation. Um, its splash, its front page is about 1.7 billion worth of cuts that mm. have uh, in Manchester that um, and, and the North 
um, that yeah. councils have had to undergo. So it's a very topical story for their readers. And you know, I want to see more than aircraft editions. Yeah. Flick through Jane, the rest of you, it. you have spent your entire life drenched in British print. Certainly, it's a very good news. It is. It's incredibly good news. And also talking about these two big stories today. You know, I am an old hack. I read newspapers. Didn't say that. I didn't I say am, that. I am. I am <laughs> freely admit it. And I love. I love newsprint. And I love newspapers. And I don't really read much online, if I'm honest. And I actually think things like the Corbyn book and the Philip Green investigation are where you really okay. want that newspaper in your hand. Well, listen, from one old hack to two fresh-faced <laughs> hacks, thank you both very much. Very interesting today. And so to the weather, no sign of the much-touted beast from the east to the inferno of snow and ice that was supposed to be hitting us this month, but very high winds causing mayhem and even some deaths around the country. Just be a little bit careful out there. Over to Darren Bett in the weather studio. Darren. Good morning. Well, the recent storm has uh, swept away now, so the winds are much lighter for today. But it does feel a bit chillier out there. We've got some sunshine developing, but there's still some areas of rain, and it'll stay wet for a while across southeast England and East Anglia. A few showers following on behind. Another band of rain coming into Northern Ireland this afternoon, and we've still got some wet weather hugging the far north of Scotland. But even with some sunshine elsewhere, those temperatures are struggling today at around 6 to 8 degrees. And this wet and windy weather in Northern Ireland will sweep down into Wales and southern England early in the night. At the same time, that wetter weather in Scotland moving southwards. A bit of sleet and snow over the hills, but petering out as it arrives in northeast England. We're drawing down some northerly air. It's getting a bit colder, so we're going to find a touch of blue, more likely to have a frost there in Scotland. But a decent start to the uh, new week. Some icy patches in northern Scotland, but a dry day on Monday. Some spells of sunshine. The winds will be quite light as well. Uh, still quite a chilly feel to the day for eastern Scotland and northeast England, but double figure temperatures across South Wales and southern England. And there's not really much rain in the forecast over the week ahead. High pressure to the southeast of the UK. We're drawing up our air from the south. That's quite mild air. So just to make it absolutely clear, there's no sign of a beast from the east two or even three. Good, good to hear. Now, with the Brexit talk still deadlocked, the EU are starting to really confront the possibility that the UK may leave without a deal. One of those who says this is now the most likely outcome is Austria's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Karin Kniesel, who now joins us from Vienna. Uh, welcome, Minister. You think that no deal is now the likeliest outcome? Yes, I have said that a few weeks ago that, uh, that we have a number of indications that lead to this conclusion. Um, and you've called it a dirty Brexit. What, what does a dirty Brexit mean? Well, I, I don't recall now that uh, attribute, but uh, uh, a hard Brexit, uh, as mm. uh, we call it. Uh, and this means that there will be a disorderly um, exit, as your colleague uh, previously just called it, crashing out. Um, and yet you say that the EU side, at least, should not be too worried about this, that you can prepare and you are preparing. Of course, uh, what we call contingency planning uh, under the heading of uh, prepared for all kind of scenarios. Uh, this has been going on uh, over the entire past year. And uh, when I took office, uh, um, I, I was told that uh, there should be um, a withdrawal agreement by mid-October in order to make sure that the ratification process, both in the UK and in the remaining 27, can be handled in a smooth way. Uh, we had the uh, EU summit on Brexit uh, on November 25th. We are now in mid-February and we are under time pressure, no doubt. Uh, let me also uh, uh, remind us all of uh, next Friday, Friday, uh, February 15th. Uh, uh, this will be exactly six weeks uh, before um, uh, the, uh, the day of exit. And uh, any ship that will leave a UK port uh, next week uh, has to know what kind of customs paper they will take along. Because it could be that when arriving in the port of destination, that either uh, the UK will be out of the EU or still inside the EU because some sort of transition period could have been arranged. So uh, the uncertainty is not something that will happen in early April. It's something that is with us, that is with any entrepreneur, with any exporter. Yeah. Uh, when we take uh, into consideration next Friday. Karen Kniesel, are you talking to the British government about no-deal preparations at the moment? Not you personally necessarily, but the EU side and the EU governments. 
Well, on behalf of the EU, it's Commissioner Michel Barnier who speaks for all of us. This is clear. But I, uh, of course, have the occasion to exchange uh, a tour d'horizon from time to time. And I had the pleasure to see again uh, my colleague, uh, Secretary uh, Jeremy Hunt, uh, past week in Bucharest when we had the EU Council uh, on Foreign Affairs. And uh, we discussed it. And of course, we have to be aware, not concentrating ourselves only on the relations EU. EU, UK, it also means UK and third countries. But to be clear, you're talking to Jeremy Hunt and others about the possibility of no deal and what happens then? Well, that we do uh, when we meet each other at mm. council meetings and the subsequent yes. uh, uh, corridor talks, dinner, whatever. But uh, when it comes to the very official lines, this is Commissioner Michel Barnier. He has both demanded for the withdrawal agreement that he negotiated, that was submitted in November, and he now has a new mandate mm. for the future relations between the UK and the EU. There so seem it's to he be who sorry. talks for all of us. I'm sorry. There seem to be two possible routes forward for a deal. One is what the Prime Minister has been, Theresa May, has been asking for, and the problem there is about the backstop. Can I ask? Is it really worth the disruption of no deal to maintain the backstop without a British escape clause or without a time limit? Are those, is the time limit and the escape clause so important to the European side that it's worth a no deal? I think the, the, the important uh, topic at stake is the peace agreement, the Good Friday Agreement. That is what we are all talking about. We are not talking here about just trade, uh, just customs. We are talking about peace in North Ireland. Mm. All right, let's look at the other possibility, which is uh, Jeremy Corbyn has suggested this week that Britain could try and stay as a member of the customs union, but also having some say on customs agreement. In your understanding, is that possible? Uh, this is to be decided, discussed first of all, and decided exclusively among uh, lawmakers uh, in, in Westminster. It's not up to me to interfere here or to comment. Um, one comment, uh, there were several comments made by high-ranking uh, commission uh, officials, and uh, I would say any uh, compromise is welcome that keeps us, all of us, afloat. But if the British said, uh, we want to stay in a customs union, we would like some say in trade deals, how would you respond? Well, <laughs> we come back to the old term that we also keep employing, it's no cherry picking. Uh, so uh, remaining in the trade deals for the British, the customs union, as uh, suggested mm. by Jeremy Corbyn, Again, it's an exclusively uh, inner internal British topic, and I, I will not further comment on that. But um, it, we, we have to know further details uh, and uh, the added value of the, of, of the suggestion um, and the backing that it has among British lawmakers. Only then there will be a fully fledged response. And would it be cherry picking to have an escape clause from the back spot, in your view? Um, I would like to link cherry picking with with uh, with the uh, uh, with this very important okay. issue of North Ireland. It will, it really has to do much more with uh, uh, the mm. long list of uh, trade uh, agreements that we have, and of course, uh, as far as I have always understood uh, the British decision makers, it's right. uh, about not being subject to a European court decision. This is something that uh, has always been high on the agenda when it came to Brexit debates. OK, now, um, you have suggested that we're quite close to running out of time for a deal. Um, time is getting short. There's a lot still to do. How would Austria respond if Britain said we would like to extend Article 50? We would like to postpone leaving for a while to sort this out. What would your answer be? Uh, we would welcome anything. Again, here, it's up to um, Michel Barnier. All the 27 will have to decide in a unanimous way to say, yes, uh, let us extend, but we have to know uh, for what kind of purpose. We have to know the, uh, mm. the substance of the proposal made by the British government. And this is a unanimous decision to be taken by 27 of us. So not no, but yes, but. Let me ask you about one other thing that's caused huge offence in Britain, which is Donald Tusk's comments about Brexiteers being, having a special place in hell. This is a human process, of course, and tempers are getting frayed, but it caused real distress and was very, very unhelpful, perhaps, to the EU side. 
yes, that's what Theresa May said. My personal reaction when I read that was, I don't believe in a place called hell. And what jumps to my mind is the famous quote by the late French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, L'enfer c'est les autres, hell are the others. And we are exactly in that situation. <laughs> we are in a situation of frustration, moods, and everybody calls the other the hellmaker. I love it that we got to Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Minister. Now, here's Joe Coburn with a preview of next week on Politics Live. Join me on Politics Live for what promises to be another big Brexit week. Tomorrow, we'll be joined by two influential backbench MPs desperately looking for solutions. Conservative Nicky Morgan and Labour's Lisa Nandy. 12.15 on BBC Two. Don't miss it. James Brokenshire, the Housing Secretary, is one of Theresa May's most trusted Cabinet Ministers. After a week of discouraging noises from Brussels, is the Prime Minister really prepared to run the clock down to no deal? And is she in any way tempted to a shift in policy towards the customs union? Let's try and find out. Uh, welcome, Mr Brokenshire. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. Um, so, Jeremy Corbyn has suggested a way through that could command a majority of votes in the House of Commons. Is the government in any way tempted by going towards a customs union? Well, what I would say is that we welcome the fact that Jeremy Corbyn wants to see a deal happening, as we profoundly do, as in the best interests of our country, and also acknowledges these issues in relation to the withdrawal, withdrawal agreement and the, and the backstop point on Northern Ireland in particular. But on this issue of the customs union, I think that what we would point to is the fact that the political declaration, what's already been negotiated around customs arrangements, gives all the benefits of a customs union in terms of no tariffs, no quotas, no restrictions, and indeed our ability to be able to conduct our trade internationally. And I think so, that's the point. So you're relatively close, actually, to what he is proposing. So what about a, a little bit of a further pivot towards the, the, the request he's made in that letter, which would allow Labour MPs to vote for a withdrawal agreement? Well, I think the point, though, is that by going down this line of the customs union and indeed other things that Jeremy Corbyn has hinted at around the single market as well, which seems to run contrary That's to not in what... his letter. That's I, well, you know, but, but, but there are issues that he's highlighted on mm. that, which seems to run contrary to things like free movement, which the Labour Party is committed to ending. And I think the point on well, the customs it? Union yeah. is that, you know, it seems to be, why would we want to have a say over EU trade rather than our own trade, our own independent trade? And I think that's okay. a, an important point of difference. There are, you know, all of these things can be smoothed over at the edges and changed a little bit. That's negotiations. But we are heading towards no deal. British industry is getting very, very worried about that. It's very close. And agreeing a customs union with the Labour Party would be one escape mechanism. And all I'm trying to discover is whether that is one that, as a party, as a cabinet, you are at all attracted by. Well, we, we've said that we're leaving the customs union and the single market. The point that I'm, I'm, I'm underlining is that the benefits that we have under the political declaration give, in essence, so much of the benefit of that free customs arrangement. And therefore, why... It'll be All interesting right. to hear further from Jeremy Corbyn as to why he doesn't see that as sufficient. You're sounding emollient. You're sounding like you want a conversation to carry on. But mm. can I ask you in absolutely straightforward terms, Jeremy Corbyn has made a proposal to the government. Are you ruling it out or not? Well, we will respond formally to Jeremy Corbyn's letter, the points that he has raised. And we want to continue discussion because we want to see, you know, the vote coming through in the House of Parliament to secure that mm. majority, actually getting a deal to happen, which is what the Prime Minister is absolutely focused on. Obviously, there is further work this week with Steve Barclay, the Brexit Secretary, meeting Michel Barnier tomorrow. They're moving on to Strasbourg, the Foreign Secretary, then also meeting his opposite number in Paris and then on to Warsaw to see the Polish Prime Minister. And there is now a process in place with President Juncker obviously now seeing the Prime Minister again before the end of this month. And therefore a sense of, yes, continued negotiations to see that we can get the necessary changes around the withdrawal agreement to see that we're dealing with the challenges that have been flagged to us in terms of the Houses of Parliament. Does the government now accept that the backstop is here to stay? Well, we accept that there is a need to uphold our commitments under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, something I believe yes, very sure, passionately is, is a Northern Ireland. Day. Well, the backstop underlines how we secure that seamless border on the island of Ireland. And indeed, when we look at, for example, the Malthouse proposals, even there, there's an acknowledgement that we need that insurance policy. We need to ensure that we have that smooth flow and upholding our duties. So to those of your colleagues, and you know who I'm talking about, who say, bin the 
backstop, your answer is that is impossible. Well, the, the, the point is, is that we need to see a free-flowing arrangement in relation to the Isle of Arden, ensuring that it's frictionless as possible, knowing what that means right. for unionists and nationalists in terms of how people live their lives there. I think you're saying the backstop stays. Mm. Well, there, yes. needs, there needs to be a backstop arrangement yes, okay. in place, an insurance policy that's there. And yet, you, like the rest of the government, voted for the, for the Brady Amendment very, very recently, which said that the, the amendment requires the Northern Ireland backstop to be replaced with alternative arrangements to avoid a hard border. You voted for it to be replaced. You know it can't be replaced. What is going on? But the point, the point, Andrew, is that the existing withdrawal agreement already contemplates alternative arrangements. That is there. That's what we want to see further explored. And indeed, getting the necessary legal changes to the withdrawal agreement that will ensure we get a majority through the House of Commons yeah, so that we can actually see whether that the backdrop's deal in or out or what it no. means. You talk about alternative arrangements. Let, let me read you this. Hmm. No technology solution to address these issues has been designed yet or implemented anywhere in the world, let alone in such a unique and highly sensitive context as the Northern Ireland border. In other words, it ain't going to happen. And yet Stephen Barclay is, is talking to Barnier tomorrow to try and make it happen. Yes, well, we want to see... We want to... But there, there are different routes do, do to agree, this. Do you agree with that the, analysis? Let, let, me just, let me just explain. There are different routes that we're looking at, which obviously is the... Uh, what the sort of... The, the proposals that have come through from some of my Conservative colleagues on alternative arrangements or indeed the separate work that Geoffrey Cox is looking at on the, on the changes they're legally not ready, they're not ready that look at a, a, either a time limit or indeed an exit mechanism. And these are the ways that we properly need to explore this. So ultimately, we get that deal, we get that agreement that we follow through on that negotiation. All of this has been rejected time and time again by the EU side. The technology changes are not possible. And that was the Prime Minister I was quoting. Mm -hmm. Your government knows that they can't be changed. So you are really, really running out of options, which is why a lot of people think your real strategy as a government is to run this right to the last minute and hope, a pa in a sense of panic, MPs change their mind just a few days before we're due to leave. Well, there, there are a few things I would say to that. Firstly, that both the EU and the UK governments want to see a deal happen. That profoundly is in our national interest. Secondly, we obviously Doesn't have... Doesn't mean it the, will. We, well, mm. but there is a negotiation... But I think there is a real focus and intent on knowing that that is in the EU's best interest, that's in our country's best interest as well. But just on, on this, I suppose, the, the, the point that you were raising about the timing of this, yeah. we obviously have this week uh, a debate in Parliament, a motion coming down, a substantive motion that the government will put forward. But I think it's also important to stress that the government will commit that if the meaningful vote, in other words, the deal coming back, has not happened by the 27th of February then we would allow a further motion, votable in Parliament, to take place, to give that sense of assurance as to the process moving forward as well in and parallel. To be absolutely clear, does that mean there will be a meaningful vote this month or not? Well, the, what I'm saying is that the, if the meaningful vote has not happened, so in other words, mm, that, that, it ha that, that you know, mm. things have not concluded, then Parliament would have that further opportunity by no later than the 27th of February. And I think that gives that sense of timetable, clarity and purpose on what we're doing with the EU, taking that work forward and our determination to get a deal, but equally knowing that a role that Parliament very firmly has. It's almost too late already, as you may have heard the Austrian Foreign Minister suggesting, for a lot of businesses, they are really running out of time, they're running out of patience, and we're now talking about running this forward into next month, just a little bit before we actually leave. This is highly irresponsible, is it not? Well, what's responsible is actually getting a deal and seeing that we have a smooth transition of us leaving the European Union. That's where our focus is as a government. Mm. Equally, how we are in contact with businesses that export to Europe, around 145,000. HMRC has been in yeah. contact with them as well. But what gives certainty is a deal. And that's why we want to see people getting behind this, getting behind this process that we now have, securing that and making it happen. Part of the pr pr preparation for no deal is the ferries coming in and out of places like Ramsgate. Um, the, the Transport Secretary, Chris Grayling, gave a contract to a company with no ferries and has now had to cancel that contract. Do you, unlike some other Tory MPs, have confidence in the Transport Secretary? Is he competent? Chris Grayling has done a huge amount of work to prepare for our departure from the European Union. And on the ferry issue, it's important to note that 90% of that capacity actually is with two other companies, Brittany Ferries and DFDS. So it's about this 10% where no public funds have actually been paid out in relation to this. And indeed, other work that Chris is doing on things like aviation. Ten aviation agreements concluded with countries like the US and Canada to right. ensure that we have that, that position in place. Do you think he's competent? Yeah, I, I think Chris 
has done a really tough job to you know, really, really positively to ensure okay, that right. we are well prepared. So I strongly uh, you know, endorse the, all the work that Chris has been doing. All right, let's talk about local authorities, which come into mm. your brief. Um, you are writing to local authorities to get them to prepare for no deal. Mm. What exactly are they supposed to do? Well, there's a range of work that local authorities are doing to look at their own, for example, their own workforce planning, to think about issues on social care provision, on other steps that may need to be needed, for example, on trading standards so, to so, implement so, so, different just, changes. Let me just stop you there. So, mm -hmm. in the event of no deal, you're concerned that social care facilities might not have enough workers to carry on operating as they are now? What, what we're looking at is what the long-term implications might be, what mm -hmm. changes may take place, ensuring that processes are there and in place. And indeed, why I've committed additional funds what to local mean? authorities in, in to real terms what do you mean well uh, what we're looking at is whether over time there may be changes in the people who are working in different in different places whether that's in so, local government or support services too so that means that there are people from the EU working in local government who may not be working in local government after no deal and you're looking at other ways of recruiting people or what well it's looking at giving the assurance because for those people who are from the EU are here giving that assurance to them that they yeah. do not need to change the work that Sajid Javid has been taking for Forward in relation to giving that assurance. So actually about information, about certainty for them so that they and are well prepared and ensure that we get that strong continuity. And this is taking people who might be working on, I don't know, council tax or refuse collection or whatever in local authority offices mm. and moving them into new offices so that they can speak to members of the public worried about what happens after no deal. Well, it, it's about communication, for example, to small businesses and therefore if there are changes that need to take place, that is well communicated on things like trading standards councils that may have ports with them. That's why mm. we have committed £56.5 million that I announced in the course of the last few weeks to support councils on their preparation. Did you write to the Chancellor asking for more money for this? Well, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to comment on correspondence that's uh, leaked or speculation on that, but uh, we have had funds that are there. Why well, I have committed you, okay, that £56.5 okay, for, million. Forget, forget the letter. Do you need more money? Well, we have got that money that's going to councils for that preparation. You've got and so £20 million. million pounds that is for the immediate pressures this year, actually responding to challenges that councils gave to me about what they're doing now. And then for the next year, further mm. funds that are being put in place there. So actually, you know, ensuring that money is going to councils now. That was my determination and that's what's happening. Are you absolutely sure, looking at the audience, looking at the camera, looking at me, that we are going to leave the EU at the end of March? Yeah, I am... Absolutely sure. I am determined that no we delay. will leave the European Union and we will leave on time. That is what the Prime Minister is determined to achieve as well. And actually having that certainty as to the departure point is focusing minds. It is seeing that people are really gripping this and that we can get that deal. Because ultimately, we need to give effect to the referendum result. That's what we want to do. And I want to just leave well and smoothly and that's where the focus is. But we're not ready, are we? Well, there are, obviously, there's still, there are still steps that are currently mm. being put in place, of course, but that's why we're looking at, for example, Parliament sitting, not having the February recess, so that we have that extra mm. space and time with okay. other legislative processes there. But clearly there is steady work that's going on, 10,000 civil servants that are now focused mm. on this, and indeed on things like the border. Border force ramping mm. up and remaining yeah. on schedule to get those extra 900 border force operators in place. We will watch and see. Now, there's been a lot of comment this week about one of your colleagues, Sir Christopher Chope, mm. stopping legislation which would have prevented female genital mutilation yeah. on really vulnerable girls going ahead. What's your reaction? Should he be disciplined for that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, really, you know, it's really shocking on, on such a, a serious issue. Female genital mutilation is something that we have got to confront, we've got to do more of. It is hugely disappointing that this, uh, this bill is not able to proceed. That's why we are now looking urgently to get government time for legislation to make this happen. Obviously, uh, Sir Christopher's own association is investigating this. I think that's the best place for this to be dealt with. But we are determined to take action to confront and combat FGM. That's why we saw this legislation as really positive, had cross-party okay. support, and why we're determined to take further action. Are you proud that he's a colleague of yours? Well, I'm, I'm just hugely disappointed. And I understand that Christopher feels uh, a lot about the process issues, about debate, about mm. how Parliament operates. But on this, I think that, you know, I hope he will even reflect, because this is a hugely sensitive and serious issue. We need to make change, and that's what we'll do. All right, Mr Brokenshaw, thanks very much indeed Thank for you, joining Andrew. us today. Spike Lee's latest movie is a political thriller set in the 1970s in Colorado when an enterprising detective infiltrates the Ku Klux Klan. Standard fare, you might think, except for the fact that the undercover plot 
cop is black. What's even more extraordinary is that the film has its roots in a true story. Black Klansman has been nominated for six Oscars. It's a tour de force not just funny, but fiery and provocative, not unlike the director himself. I caught up with Spike ahead of tonight's BAFTA Awards. The KKK is planning an attack. How do you propose to make this investigation? We'll establish contact over the phone. We'll need a white officer to play me when they meet face to face. You for the white race, Ron? Oh, hell yeah. So there becomes a combined Ron Stallworth. Can you do that? With the right white man, we can do anything. The humor comes from the absurdity of the premise. When Jordan Peele called me, get out of fame, called me up and said, uh, I want to pitch you something. And it was a six word pitch. Black man infiltrates Ku Klux Klan. So the humor comes out of the absurdity of that pitch. With that, you have to get the right balance, tone between humor and the very serious subject matter. And it's sometimes number four in films like uh, Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X. There's never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. Hello, this is Ron Stallworth calling. Well, who am I speaking with? This is David Duke. Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That David Duke? God. Last time I checked. What can I do you for? Well, since you asked, I hate blacks. I hate Jews, Mexicans, and Irish, Italians, and Chinese. But my mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. God bless white America. To what extent is this film driven by your anger about what's going on at the moment in America and around the world? Well, I'm afraid to answer that because so often, you know, I've been labeled as an angry black man. But nonetheless, there's stuff to be angry about. I'm angry about the President of the United States saying Mexicans are rapists, murderers, and drug dealers. So therefore, the wall should be built. And then on top of that, make, make the murderers, rapists, and drug dealers pay for the wall, which is insanity. I'm mad about infants, babies, torn from their mother's arms, and families separated. There's thousands of kids, they don't even know who their parents are. There's, there's a lot to be angry, angry about. You were angry about what Liam Neeson said recently? Oh yeah, I don't understand what he was doing. So uh, it's a crazy, crazy, bizarre world we live in. It seems to me that you know, I've not spoken to Liam, but I don't know why he did it, but he did it. So he's, uh, he's going through it now. I just, I just saw the clip and he did not look, uh, one of the clips of, on this apology tour, See, he did not look happy. Would you cast him now? Now? I, I tried to cast one time, and so far we haven't got the money for that film, but one day we will. But I don't think I'll be going back to him for it. I mean, he's too old now. That was like a long time ago. It's, very, it's bad all around. It's bad all around. So. Uh, I don't know, but I heard he was promoting this new movie and it's about revenge and somehow, I know he's Catholic. Is this, was this a form of a confession? I don't know, you have to ask him. Gary Young, who's one of our uh, most prominent black journalists in this country, wrote of the Liam Neeson case. He said, what this really shows is for a lot of white people, black men in particular, are still not quite human. People have to understand history. The Ku Klux Klan was formed to save white Southern womanhood. To save, did you look at the clips from Dita Griffin's Birth of a Nation? A white woman jumps off a cliff to her death rather than be touched by a beast. Who knows how many innocent black men have been murdered castrated, lynched, or hung, or spent time in jail because of, only because a white woman said that black man raped her. 
So uh, you set alight the Bernie Sanders campaign on one occasion, and then, of course, the Democrats were divided and Hillary ran and didn't win. They're divided now. How many people are running for president now? I was, I was going to ask you your view of what kind of candidate can take on Donald Trump now, do you think, and win in the future? I think that it's going to have to be a young person, a fairly, a, a fairly young person, one who's uh, inclusive, one who has love in their heart, one who's not going to be divisive, but one also, when you get in the ring, you have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. You know, I know there's this thinking like, take the high road, but not with this guy. This guy, you got to get dirty, down and dirty, take the, the gloves off with this guy. It sounds to me like you're saying not a celebrity because all the names that have been mentioned so far, you know, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Hillary Clinton again, you know, they're all well known. That is definitely not going to work, especially Miss Ms. Ms. Hillary Clinton. So it's going to have to be somebody entirely new, or somebody we don't know about yet. Hey, who knew, who ever heard of Obama? You know, you don't know who's out there. We get Spike Lee films in this country pretty regularly. Since 1986. And since 1986. He's got to have it. We don't very often see Spike Lee in this country, and it's BAFTA season at the moment. I'm here a lot. I, I, Arsenal's my team. <laughs> really? So I just don't announce it, you know? I like to slip in and slip out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason why I'm here is because I'm here for the BAFTA Awards, and this is the first time I've ever been nominated. Never been nominated before. Ever. Ever. And the BAFTAs... Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Just want to make that point. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> the one and only Spike Lee there and Black Klansman is up for no fewer than five BAFTA awards. You can see how it does tonight at 9 o'clock here on BBC One. Well, as we've said, Labour has made a significant change in Brexit policy this week, but is it deliverable and is it really Brexit? The move hasn't pleased everyone and Labour's also been struggling yet again with rifts over the party's handling of accusations of anti-Semitism and rumours that some MPs might finally walk away. Labour's Deputy Leader Tom Watson joins me now from Birmingham. Uh, welcome, Mr Watson. Can Good I start night. by asking about the, the new offer on Brexit that Labour has made this week? When you say that you want membership of a customs union in perpetuity, but some say over customs policy, what the Austrian foreign minister just called cherry picking, what do you mean by a say over trade policy? Look, it's a serious offer, this. Uh, the letter last week came as a result of Theresa May's offer at the dispatch box uh, in the no confidence vote uh, a week or two before. Uh, and what we're really saying is, it, come and meet us on our calls for closer economic realignment. You, you know, we think there's only three options available for the country. Either crash out with a hard Brexit, find consensus across the chamber, across all political parties, or have a public vote. And, you know, when Theresa made that, made that offer, it was kind of a surprise for us. We didn't know she was going to do it, but we're duty-bound to listen to her, and we think that was a serious offer. We're very pleased that a number of Conservative MPs said it looks uh, doable, uh, and that the European negotiators have said it looks doable. So um, that's really what we're about, uh, and, that, and that's what last week represented. You may have heard James Brokenshire there. doesn't like everything about it, but he says that talk should carry on. So this is a genuine, serious possibility of tilting towards a customs union between the Conservative Party and the Labour front bench. That's going to, you're going to talk this week. Yes, it's very, very serious. Uh, and we need to make sure that, um, you, you know, we did have our reservations. It was, it was very sort of uncharacteristic. We, we were surprised when Theresa May reached out because you'd normally get wind that these things are happening. So it took us a bit of time to sort of establish the sort of ground rules to this. But if she's prepared to come and meet us on our genuine worry that this, the current proposals will affect jobs, particularly in the manufacturing heartlands where I am right now, then we'll talk to her. But of course, if she doesn't go that way, if she chooses to go with a hard okay. right, people who want to crash out, then um, are, we've still got the people's vote option. There are, well, there are, I'll come on to that, but there are two real problems with your proposal that I see at the moment. One, you can't be in the customs union or a customs union and have an independent trade policy that goes completely against the Treaty of Rome. 
Well, we were very pleasantly surprised and pleased when Donald Tusk leaned into the letter. He said it could be the basis of a new deal. So what we hope is, we, first of all, we can get the Prime Minister to accept our proposals, and then if she agrees yeah. it, let's go to the European negotiators and see whether we can find some leeway there. But you know they regard this as cherry-picking. Is it a say you want or actually a veto? And if it's just a say, could that be alongside current arrangements? In other words, is there room for manoeuvre on this? Well, I think there's always room for manoeuvre when negotiators are prepared to look at all options. And the tragedy of this is we were kind of locked out of this process for nearly two years. All the party leaders were essentially rejected by mm -hmm. Theresa May. She thought she could do it on okay. her own with her own party. And we, we've only just been given this offer in the last mm -hmm. few weeks. Uh, so let's try and find some space to see whether there is room for progress. So the second obvious problem with your proposal is what happens to free movement. One of your front bench colleagues has said uh, in the past week that free movement is on the table. In other words, you might accept free movement, which a lot of your own voters would not regard as Brexit. Well, look, we're looking for a new set of arrangements, and it does seem to me that the domestic context across the EU, particularly in Germany, Italy and Spain, on the current free movement arrangements are under question domestically. So it may be that a new deal around a customs union could refresh uh, uh, the talks about what free movement looks like. Uh, uh, and, you know, if you're going to reopen negotiations, let's take a look at that. And is this Labour's final offer, this or you insist on another referendum? Look, we've been pretty consistent on our red lines. We, we're duty-bound to take the Prime Minister's offer of consensus talk seriously, and I hope that that letter represents that. And we were pleased that a number of her parliamentary colleagues in the Conservative Party think it is. Um, but obviously if that fails, yes, the final option, because we think that's the only way that we can deal with the on pass, is a public vote. And, you know, John McDonnell said that this week, Keir Starmer said it consistently, and I'm saying it today as well. And that is definitely still on the table, the public vote, because some of your colleagues on the pro-referendum side of the party were livid about that letter. They thought it was brushing aside the likelihood of the speed of a, another referendum and even threatening to walk out of the party as a result. Well, I'm sorry they were because, you know, we have a very clear policy set by our conference, 100 delegates in a room for a whole day with Keir Starmer. Uh, you know, I could repeat uh, all the mantra again about what that is, but it seems to me we're now at the point where we can have meaningful talks to get a deal between the main political party leaders or they're, the only way to break the on pass is a public vote, and that remains our policy. You've been in the Labour Party all your adult life. You've given a lot of service to it. Looking at where you are now as a party, are you genuinely worried there may be a split or a splinter coming? I am worried about it, even though, you know, I, I read the media reports like you, Andrew, uh, and I've said before, I think I've said it to you on your programme, that, you know, I hope people will stay and fight their cause, you, you know, because an electorally viable Labour Party addressing the issues that the future economy is going to bring workers in this country is always the best vehicle for social change. So I hope that we stay together as a party and that these sort of media rumours do not come to fruition. Well, one of the people, of course, who's been the focus of these rumours is Luciana Berger, the, the MP for Liverpool Wavertree. Um, she has been very, very upset, as you know, about the party's handling of the anti-Semitism problem, um, and she has faced... Uh, a vote of no confidence now dropped by her Waver Tree constituency. Can I ask you, what do you think is going on in Liverpool Waver Tree? She's been bullied. That motion should never have been moved uh, in a local party. The meeting to hear it should never have been heard. The net effect is there are obviously a small group of members in that area that are trying to drive her out as the MP. And I think that's unacceptable. And Jeremy Corbyn this week, when we met our backbenchers, said on three occasions that these things are not done in his name. And I repeat that again. Those people who even think they're helping Jeremy Corbyn when they do this kind of stuff are not helping him. They're harming the reputation of the Labour Party. They're creating division. And ultimately, the person who will lose out the most is Jeremy Corbyn because they'll make it harder for him to be Prime Minister and get the political and economic change we want to see in this country.
party, the local party says we are only doing our job of holding our MP to account. John McDonnell, the shadow chancellor, said on the radio this week, Luciana has been in the media associated with a breakaway party or whatever and hasn't been clear in stating that she rejects my... My advice to Luciana is just tell people you're not supporting a breakaway party, you're sticking with the Labour Party. She is eight and a half months pregnant. It sounds as if you know, more, more pressure is being piled on her right. What's your response to that? Well, she is being put under pressure. She's been the subject of anti-Semitic death threats. She's been intimidated. She's been bullied. And I don't want any MP or any member of the Labour Party to feel that they're being bullied or driven out. And what's, what has happened to her is completely unacceptable, which is why I called for the local party to be suspended. But if um, she is uh, associated with some possible breakaway party, in a sense, isn't John McDonnell right to be worried and right to be calling on her to renounce that idea? We're all worried about a breakaway because, you know, we need unity in order to win the next general election, which we think will help the millions of people that have lost out by austerity. And I don't want to lose Luciana. She's not just a valued colleague and comrade, but she's also a friend. And I've seen the intolerable pressure she's been put under. Uh, and I can only repeat to you, Andrew, this bullying has to stop. She's not the only one who's been the subject to anti-Semitic abuse and people who disagree with her. Uh, you know, in political parties, we need a pluralism. We need to hear voices, uh, have greater respect for people who disagree with each other. Uh, and it seems to me that not just the Labour Party, but the whole country is slipping into division with hate fueled debate. That's not going to help anyone no. because there's bigger challenges coming down the line after Brexit. You know, there are nine million jobs at risk when artificial intelligence starts to develop across different industrial sectors. That's what people want from political parties. They want us to address future challenges and that's not happening when we're having these internal rows about bullying. Clearly the country or parts of the country are getting angrier and angrier over Brexit and from both sides MPs including Labour MPs have had some very very aggressive threats. They don't talk about it in public but there have been physical violence threats, there have been death threats um, and there are even suggestions that is starting to uh, uh, affect people's behaviour inside the House of Commons. Have you any insight to shred on this? Well I know of one MP who has confidentially told me that they changed their vote on one particular key vote because they felt frightened for their own safety. Uh, you, you know, when you get to that point, you, you know, I always just say to, you know, people involved in politics, remember, it's in the last few years that we've had a dear and valued colleague that has been assassinated by a far-right uh, fanatic. Uh, so MPs are intimidated uh, uh, and it's really important that political leaders stand up and say we are, we are not going to accept this threats of violence and intimidation because it erodes our democracy and it's going to drive good people who want to change the world out of politics and nobody wants that. Are the police taking it seriously enough? Well, I hope they are. Uh, I don't deal directly with them. Our party managers do that. Uh, but one thing I have suggested at my shadow cabinet is perhaps it's time to look at a new security paradigm where we provide security and or two MPs based on the threat level rather than the position they hold. Uh, and that might be one way that we can resource you know, proper security to MPs. Jenny Formby, uh, Labour's General Secretary, upset some Jewish Labour MPs in particular when she was responding on the anti-Semitism uh, affair earlier in the week. But she has now said that she is going to reveal the number of cases that the Labour Party is currently dealing with. Do you know what the figure is? And can I you tell us? I, I don't know what the figure is, but uh, I raised this point at our National Executive Committee. Uh, you know, we have changed our internal procedures, but there's no point in changing the procedures unless we can p build political trust again with the British Jewish mm. community, and that requires greater transparency. And I'm, gra I'm glad she's um, uh, ceded yes. to the request of my colleagues on that. We're running out of time, but Jenny Formby also said that she didn't have any constitutional uh, powers to suspend the Waver Tree constituency. Is that true? I don't know. I, I mean, she's also conferred to me that she is investigating members in that constituency. And actually, I ha I've had another complaint this evening that uh, I need to follow up later today. So it does seem to me there are grounds for a suspension. Uh, I can only repeat again, I think Luciana is being bullied and there are local members in Liverpool Wave Tree responsible for that and others. And that is unacceptable. And it is incumbent on political leaders to make sure that doesn't happen. Tom Watson, thanks very much indeed for talking to us this morning. Now a look at what's coming up on BBC One at half past 11.
Join us at 11.30, live from Newport, where the big questions will be debating surrogacy. Should it be run by commercial businesses? And then, God and your psyche. Is religion good for your mental health? I can promise a lively debate, real-life stories, and by then, an audience ready to encourage and join in. That's 11.30 on BBC One. And that's all from us this week. I'm here on my Todd, but thanks to all my guests. A big day for us again next Sunday at 10. Join me then. Goodbye. <laughs>